This brush fire in Ventura County exploding overnight, going from sparks to over 8,000 acres in about six hours. Ang lindol sa bayan ng magsaysay sa Davao del Sur. Isa ang bayan ng magsaysay sa Davi sa napinsala o naapektuhan ng nangyaring tatlong sunod-sunod na paglilindol sa Mindanao. Sa Are you ignoring God's call? Perhaps you didn't realize you were ignoring His call or didn't even know God was calling you. What is God trying to warn you about? And what is the danger if you don't answer His call? That's what we'll talk about today here on the Iglesia Ni Cristo International Edition. Brothers, uh, we've heard of the stories of people ignoring important calls, warning them of impending danger. Sadly, though, these have resulted in them being harmed or them meeting disaster because either they weren't listening or they chose not to listen or heed the warnings that were given. One very important call we don't want anyone to ignore or miss is the call of God. Now, before we proceed, uh, we would like to first make it clear to everyone that we're not saying that God personally spoke to us to convey His call to you. That's not the case. Rather, this call from God can be clearly read in the Bible. Now, brothers, uh, what is the truth? Br Brother Bernard, let's start with you. Whom is God calling and what is His call all about? Well, Brother Greg, for that, let's turn to the Bible and I will read what is recorded in the book of Psalms, chapter 49, verse 1 and 2, which says this. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. Whom is God made a call to? The Bible clearly teaches to all peoples, to all inhabitants of the world. So no matter what condition or quality of life, God has made a call to everyone and everyone. Uh, that, that being said, uh, Brother Bernard, of course, that would mean that regardless of where someone is in the world or whatever they may be doing, no one is exempt from this call of God. Okay, br Brother Noel, that being said, why is God calling on all people, regardless of their status in life, regardless of where they are in this world? Why is God's call going out to all people? What is, what is one of the things He wants all people to know? Brother Greg and dear viewers, let us first read what is written in Isaiah 24, 1 and 3, which states, The Lord is going to devastate the earth and leave it desolate. The earth will be shattered and ruined. The Lord is spoken, and it will be done. What is one of the reasons God is calling on all kinds of people? God is warning all kinds of people of the devastation He will bring upon this world. Thus, since this warning came from God, this is not a warning that people should take lightly. This is not a warning that people should dismiss or even ignore. Okay, that, that being said then, Brother Noel, the, the question then is this, knowing that all people are included in this warning of God throughout the world, the question then would be, when and how would this happen? When, when and how would this type of destruction or this type of devastation occur? Brother Donald. Well, to answer that question, Brother Greg, let us read 2 Peter 3, and the verses are 7 and 10. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire, until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So please notice, beloved viewers, when it comes to the destruction that the Lord our God forewarned about, it will take place on the Day of Judgment, which is also the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. How is it that this devastation will take place? According to what we have read, the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, there will be an immense and horrific fire come the Day of Judgment. 
the whole world will be consumed by fire. And because of this, there is no escape, there's no hiding for anyone come that horrific day. The whole world will burn. Why did God decide to destroy the earth? In the sight of God, what has become of the world and its inhabitants or the people of the world? Well, for that answer, Brother Greg, if we can turn back to the book of Isaiah, to chapter 24, and this time we will read now in verse 5 to 6. This is what the Holy Scriptures will tell us. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore, earth's inhabitants are burned up, and very few are left. In the sight of God, what has become of the world? The Bible clearly states the earth is defiled by its people, which is why God has declared to destroy it. Now, why has the earth been defiled by its people? The Bible reminds us that they have disobeyed the laws and violated the statutes. Isn't this what we see happening today? What kind of news do we read in the newspapers or hear on the radio, TV, and even the internet? We hear all these reports of very heinous crimes like robbery, murder, rape, kidnapping, and many others. But what should we remember when we hear this news? This is the reason why God has decided to destroy this world. So that's what we need to understand, beloved viewers. And even though some might say, well, don't worry, there are authorities, there are people that have been placed in power to try to stop doing and to solve these problems of violence. Yeah, Brother Bernard, again, it's good that you mentioned that for the sake of, of our dear viewers, because, you know, we, we see, we see, we hear, we may read all of these kinds of atrocities that are going on in the world at present. And, of course, God has, has weighed in and said, well, this is the reason why. It's because people have disobeyed my laws. They've disobeyed my commands. And so there is this kind of propensity, this kind of evil that is going on in the world. And yet government agencies, those in power, local governments and, and local agencies, they're trying to curtail, they're trying to lessen the amount of, of crimes that are going on in the world. But then the question still is this, despite their best effort, can man truly improve the bad condition of this world in order to save it from its impending destruction? Brother Noel, I'll go to you for that one. Uh, Brother Greg, let me answer that by reading what's in Isaiah 24, 19 to 20. The earth will crack and shatter and split open. The earth itself will stagger like a drunk, sway like a hut in a storm. The world is weighed down by its sins. It will collapse and never rise again. What does the Bible ensure will happen to this world? The verses say the earth will crack and shatter. Uh, to what is this world today likened? The Bible also tells us the earth will stagger like a drunk, sway like a hut in a storm. So can man truly improve the bad condition of the world in order to save it from destruction? Well, sad to say, the answer is no, because the Bible tells us the world is weighed down by its sins. It will collapse and never rise again. Hence, what is being forewarned to us by all the evils happening in this world? The destruction of this world that God warned about, which will happen on the day of judgment. So dear friends, the question is this, knowing that God himself is the one who's given the warning, knowing the scope of the destruction that's going to take place, are we going to ignore the call of God? Are we going to dismiss this warning that God has given? Because... What, what's saddening is, for example, there's an impending destruction that's forthcoming. And there is a forewarning that is given concerning it. People would adhere to it. There's a forthcoming hurricane, for example. Now, people would vacate the area where that hurricane would supposedly pass. But the question then is this. When God is the one giving the warning, there are many people who dismiss it. There are many people who will just ignore it or even doubt that it would ever take place. But why should we never doubt that judgment that God has decreed upon the world and has appointed? We'll discuss this and much more as the Blessing in Cristo International Edition continues.
Welcome back, dear friends, as we continue with our discussion pertaining to God's call to all people living in this world. Now, before we continue, let's take a look at another video to show what some people do when they receive a call to evacuate from an impending or forthcoming danger. Take a look at this. Some 400,000 Gulf Coast residents in Florida were told to evacuate ahead of Hurricane Michael. Most did, but many did not. And as the search for the dead continues this morning, we're once again confronted with a sad question. Why won't people heed a life and death warning? Never been through a hurricane before, heard lots about it, watched them on television. We'd stay and see it out. I hope that guy made it, but I'm afraid we're in store for many stories over the next few days of people who didn't because they just didn't believe the authorities when they warned of what was coming. So what can be done about that going forward? In a study done after Hurricane Katrina, Akron University professor Stacy Willette found several factors at play with danger deniers. Older people with physical or economic restrictions were less likely to leave their homes. Men were more likely to shrug off warnings than women. And peer pressure was also a factor from friends and neighbors or from from the likes of Rush Limbaugh, who repeatedly scoffs at evacuation requests as a political scam designed to promote global warming theories. This devastation doesn't look like a scam to me. But Dr. Willett says the antidote to evacuation refusal lies in the same force we see at play in the aftermath of natural disasters, community solidarity. Brothers, it is really saddening to see that even though there was an impending danger, as mentioned, Many people did heed the warning uh, of this impending danger, but then he said most didn't. Brothers, when you see things like this, what, what, what is it that comes to mind? What is it that you're, you're thinking of uh, when you see these kinds of things happening? Brother Donald? Well, Brother Greg, it's the consequences of not heeding the warning that was issued. You know, for those who, for example, the one individual said he wanted to actually watch the devastation come along. I mean, uh, considering that we're talking about life and death here, when it comes to a very serious warning that's been issued, well, people right. should take heed and they should follow the instructions in order to be saved. Uh, yes, of, of course. Brother Bernard, you're, you're, uh, in your area, do you find that there are also these kinds of warnings? Maybe not necessarily a, a hurricane, but what other kind of devastations may happen that people need to heed, for example? Well, Brother Greg, the authorities and those who are placed to make sure that people will remain safe are always giving us warnings about many different calamities, whether it be floods, whether it be uh, signs of an earthquake, and they do their best really to get this warning out. And even though it's sad because, you know, whenever there's a chance, a danger of a loss, especially a loss of life, you know, that's a very sad situation. But what makes it even more heartbreaking is if when there's a warning, there's a chance that one could do something, take action to save themselves, save their loved ones. And then when they don't, well, we can see the consequences quite clearly. And I think part of it as well, uh, br brothers, uh, is uh, the fact that there, there are things that we can do prior to such kind of event happening. You know, prior to a forthcoming hurricane, for example, or, or even though our earthquakes may not be able to be warned about so far in advance, but still there are things we can still do to help, help ourselves in a preventable manner, uh, not to be so devastatingly affected by these things. And those are good points, brothers, but here's the major point that we have to understand, dear friends, pertaining to God's call to all of humanity. Considering that this impending judgment of God is not merely a localized event, not, not something that's just going to affect one part of a particular country or a city or a town, uh, but a destruction of epic worldwide proportions, why should no one doubt the judgment that God has appointed? What example did God give to prove that the judgment He appointed would surely happen, which, is, which means we shouldn't doubt it. We know it's going to happen, so we need to take preventive measures. Brother Donald, let me, let me toss that one to you. Why don't we read 2 Peter 2 and the verses of 5 to 7 to answer your question, Brother Greg. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, 
and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. The Holy Scriptures records two prime examples of devastation that befell the life of man in the time of Noah and also in the time of Lot. Now, why is it that this happened when he came to the people at that time? Why is it that the Lord our God brought about a great destruction? How many people were saved, in fact, when he came to the time of Noah? It was just eight people, Noah and his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and also the respective wives. Eight people were saved at that time. How about in a time of Lot? It was Lot and his immediate family, even though tragically, his wife, even though she was on the path to be saved, well, she did not fully obey the instructions and she was turned into a pillar of salt, meaning to say she was destroyed. Now, is it not that the Lord our God gave a call or a warning to the people in those times? Well, the answer is a definite yes. The Lord our God utilized Noah as a preacher of righteousness. And Noah told the people that they should change their ways in order to be saved from the impending doom. In fact, they were instructed to join him and his family on the ark. But tragically, so many people, they ignored that call. In fact, they thought that Noah was insane because he was building this great boat or ark on dry land. Well, how about in the time of Lot? Did the Lord our God also issue a warning? And the answer is yes. The Lord our God sent two messengers. Tragically, when it comes to too many people nowadays, they are likened to those who did not listen in the time of Noah and also in the time of Lot. And one reason why people refuse to listen is because they may say, day or the day of judgment has not yet happened. But beloved viewers, just because the day of judgment has not yet occurred, does it mean to say that it will never happen? Yeah, very, very good points, Brother Donald. In fact, uh, you know, knowing that God himself is the one that has made the decree, knowing that he's given examples, biblical examples of great catastrophes that had taken place in, to those who did not heed his warning, the question that we have to pose then now is this. In our time, and as you mentioned, Brother Donald, and, and for our panelists and dear friends, you know, this warning of God has been given thousands of years in advance. We, we read it in the Bible. And so people would say, look, it, it's, it's always been talked about. When I was still a young kid, my, my parents were talking about, you know, this, this day of gloom and doom is going to come soon. And still, I'm, I'm still here. My generations have followed. Nothing has happened. But again, as you mentioned, Brother Donald, for our dear friends and, and those joining us today, does it mean that we should just ignore it because it hasn't happened? Let us pose this question to the apostles. Uh, Brother Bernard, I'll toss this one to you. Why indeed has the judgment God forewarned not happened yet? Is it because it's not going to happen? What's the reason why, Brother Bernard? Well, Brother Greg, when it comes to God's judgment, we don't want to speculate. We don't want to give our own opinion or theory. So let's just turn once again to what is recorded in the Bible. And as you said, the apostles will teach us here in the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3, verses 7, and also verse 9. Please allow me to read and take note. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why? Well, what does it mean that the day of judgment has not happened yet? Does that mean that it's not going to happen? The Bible reminds us that the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. It's being kept for the day of judgment. So what does it mean that the day of judgment has not happened yet? The Bible also reminds us the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. But again, this is just a manifestation of his patience, of his mercy. Because what does God truly want? He doesn't want anyone to perish. 
but they want to have that chance to come to repentance. They want to have that chance to be saved. Okay, Brother Bernard, that being said, look, the question that we have to pose then is this, because people might be thinking, look, you know, we understand God's patience. He is truly a patiently loving God. And because of His patience, He's allowed time to pass, giving people the opportunity to heed this call that He's given. However, according to God Himself, is the destruction of the world He forewarned still far away? Is it still that far distant in the future? Uh, for that, uh, let's go to you there, Brother Noel. Let us read in Ezekiel 7, 5 to 8. This is what the Sovereign Lord is saying. One disaster after another is coming on you. It's all over. This is the end. You are finished. The end is coming for you people who live in the land. The time is near when there will be no more celebrations at the mountain shrines, only confusion. Very soon now, you will feel all the force of my anger. I am judging you for what you have done, and I will pay you back for all your disgusting conduct. What does the Lord God want all people to know? He said it's all over. This is the end. You're finished. The end is coming for you people who live in the land. The time is coming when there will be no more celebrations at the mountain shrines, only confusion. Very soon now, you will feel all the force of my anger. I am judging you for what you have done, and I will pay you back for all your disgusting conduct. Yes, yeah, so Brother Noel, God Himself indeed did decree that the time is near that there wouldn't be any more celebrations, that destruction is going to come. So it's not far off. We can't just sit back and say, well, it's been going on for generations, for hundreds or even thousands of years, so no, we still got a lot of time. We don't, we don't have to really heed right away this call of God. No, we can, we can just wait uh, for more time to pass because God is patient. But God is telling us here, as you, as you mentioned, Bro Brother Noel, and to our dear friends, that the time is already near, that this destruction is going to come. So that being said, others may be thinking this, look, we know that life in this world is hard. We see it, we hear about it, we read about it, and uh, we live it because we live in a world that is fallen. We live in a world where, where God's anger is shown because of the sins that people has committed against Him. And so there are so many things, so many difficulties, trials and afflictions that people go through. And then it's going to end up being that people are going to be punished. So people might be thinking, but did God just create man for him to be destroyed and, and to be punished? Is, was that God's plan all along? Bro Brother Donald, let me, let me toss that one to you. Brother Greg, in Ezekiel 18, the verses 32, we can read the following. For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Very, very clearly, Brother Greg and beloved viewers, the Lord our God takes no pleasure in the death of one who dies. The Lord our God loves man whom He has created. That is why before the destruction of this world, the Lord our God has already pronounced, He's already announced, He has already made a call unto man that man needs to respond to in order for them to be saved from this destruction. And what is the call of the Lord our God? He wants man to return unto Him. If man is able to answer the call of God and return unto Him, they will not be included in the impending destruction that the whole world will face. Brother Donald, that's a good point uh, because uh, we have to understand that it has been God's policy ever since that before he brings about a destruction, he's going to give fair warning first. It was proven, for example, in the time of Noah, as was read earlier. It was proven in the time of Lot, as was also read earlier. So before this impending destruction comes, this day of judgment, the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, God's policy continues. He's giving fair warning to all who live on the earth. But then one might be thinking, okay, well, it's just a warning. How would I be able to escape this impending judgment? I don't want to ignore this call of God. So what can I do to heed this call of God? Did God teach the way for people to be able to return to Him, to, to escape 
this impending judgment that he's going to bring about upon all the inhabitants uh, of the earth or the world, Bro Brother Bernard? Brother Greg, you're absolutely correct that God not only gave a warning, but he also gives an instruction that we must heed, we must follow so that we can be saved. Listen to what's recorded in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, and allow me to read verse 16 and also verse 19. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it, then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words, nor my law, but rejected it. What is the instruction of God? so that they would be able to repent, so that they would be able to return to him. The Lord says, stand in the ways and see, ask for the old paths and find where the good way is. Why do we need to find the good way? Because our almighty God declared it will lead to peace or rest for your souls, or meaning the salvation from the impending destruction. But what has been the response, the answer to God's call, according to what we have read? The Bible says that God will certainly bring calamity on this people because they have not heeded his words or his call, but they rejected it when they said, we will not walk in it. Brother Bernard, again, great points. Dear friends, here's the question then to you. From ancient times, before an impending judgment that God had brought about, he gave fair warning. In this call of God that will bring about a destruction, a global destruction for all the inhabitants of the earth, Here's the question. Will you be like others as well who will say, no, 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 we won't walk in your way, Lord. No, no, we, we'll do our own way. We'll follow our own way. Is that the answer we're going to give to this call of God, beloved friends? When God has given you a, an instruction by which you can escape this impending judgment, we hope that you won't, dear friends, because we, we as well as God, wants us to be saved. He doesn't take pleasure in people dying. He wants us to return to Him. He wants us to serve Him. Of course, others would say, well, that's exactly why I haven't rejected God's way to salvation. Because I've sought for that good way, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. I professed Him, accepted Him, recognized Him as, as my Lord, my, my Savior. And so they would proclaim and conclude that they won't be punished, but rather they'll be saved come judgment day. But is that enough? Are they correct? Are all professing Christians, have all professing Christians answered God's call? That and many other important questions will be answered as we continue here in the Leshni Cristo International Edition. Welcome back, everyone, as we continue our discussion on God's call to humankind. Before we continue, let's take a look at the prevailing belief of many professing Christians as to their answer to God's call through their acceptance of Jesus Christ. So as we're all sinners, God sent His only Son to die upon a cruel cross. The third thing I want to look at is that all it takes for you to accept Jesus Christ is simple faith. It doesn't take works. It's not about doing anything. But rather, it is simply believing. Believing. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 tells us, we are saved by faith or by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Works cannot save us. No matter what you try to do, it cannot save you. The only thing that can save you is simple faith. Brothers, uh, we know that's a prevailing belief throughout those who profess to be Christians. Uh, do you also see that in your areas, in your, in your parts of the world there, brothers? Is that also what is prevailing there where you are? Uh, Brother Greg, when it comes to here in Canada, we can definitely see or witness those who claim that just believing in our Lord Jesus Christ a person will be assured of attaining salvation. Uh, however, when it comes to even the video that we just viewed, when it came that that individual, he quoted one citation or one verse. 
Well, in truth, when it comes to the gospel truth, it's made up of many verses, many citations. In fact, we have been instructed to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. So even though faith is important, does the Bible teach that through faith alone a person will be saved? And just to add to that, Brother Donald, even here in America, it's a very popular and widespread belief that one simply has to have faith alone, and that's enough to be saved. Simply accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, believe in Him, offer prayers to Him, and that's all you need to do is what they teach, and that's enough to receive salvation or to answer the call of God. But, beloved brothers, we should make it clear to our televiewers, we're not saying that faith is not important. We do believe that faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and accepting Him as Savior, that's very important for us also. But we cannot take this step further and say, that's all we have to do. Right. In fact, you know, if, okay, let's apply what the gentleman in the video said to this call of God, to this call of God now. If, if God is calling you, He's giving you a warning, and then He's going to give you instructions as to what you should do to escape this impending judgment, are you just going to say, no, no, I, I believe in God, that's enough. I, I don't need to do what He's going to instruct me to do. I'll just believe in Him. Would that warrant you the salvation that you're looking for? Be, dear friends, before the break, we learned from the Bible that God, though He has warned of an impending judgment, doesn't want people to perish, but to find salvation for their souls. In the Christian era, did our Lord Jesus Christ teach how people could be saved? Brother Noah, let me, let me go to you for that one. Well, I'll answer that right away. Uh, yes, our Lord Christ Jesus also taught how people can be saved. The Lord God wants everyone to be saved. Christ, in like mind, wants everyone to be saved. And, and this is the way that He taught. Uh, let us read Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Heaven can be entered only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide enough for all the multitudes who choose its easy way. But the gateway to life is small, and the road is narrow, and only a few ever find it. So our Lord Christ Jesus taught that when it comes to reaching that safe place or that salvation, heaven can be entered only through the narrow gate. The gateway to life is small, and the road is narrow, and very few might find it. Why? Well, because many people want the easy way. Many people want the broad way, where our Lord Christ Jesus said, well, that's the way not to heaven, but that's the way that leads to hell. Okay, Brother Noel, that, that being said, here's, here's another issue that we have to answer as well. Uh, knowing that God has given this these steps in order for one to be saved. He, we mentioned it prior to the break, uh, wherein God said, look for the good way where the, old, uh, the, the good way is and walk in it. Again, going back to what the gentleman in the video had said, if, if we're just going to accept Jesus as our Lord and personal Savior, and again, that's what we, it's important that we recognize Him as our Lord, we accept Him as our Lord and, and our personal Savior, but then we're not going to do anything, how would we be able to heed what God is instructing us to do through our Lord Jesus Christ, which is to get to that narrow way because that's the only way that man can get into heaven or that man can be saved. It's through the narrow gate or through the narrow way that's taught by our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and of course, bro Brother Donald, who is the gate and the way that leads to life according to our Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, Brother Greg, let me read John 10, 7 and of verses 9. This is the declaration, in fact, the instruction of our Savior Jesus Christ. And he says, So he explained it to them. I am the gate for the sheep, he said. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in by way of the gate will be saved. So to the question, Brother Greg, who is that narrow gate? Who is that way? Well, none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, many people may claim, well, I've entered that way, I've entered the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore I will be saved. However, is it enough for a person to claim 
that they have entered our Lord Jesus Christ in order for Christ to recognize them as those who have entered into him? Well, what does the Bible teach? How can one identify those who truly have entered our Lord Jesus Christ? You're right, Brother Donald, because in, in order to identify those people who have walked or entered Christ, they've done something. It's not something that they just accepted Jesus as their Lord and personal Savior. They have done what Jesus has instructed them to do. They've gone in by Him into uh, the as the gateway, they've entered in by Him. So it wasn't just something that they had uh, believed in. There's something that they did. How can we identify those who did it, who entered in and walked in our Lord Jesus Christ? Brother Bernard, I'll go to you for that one for clarity. Uh, what did our Lord Jesus Christ teach? Brother Greg, if we may go back to what we read, John 10, 9, in another translation of the Bible, please take note to what our Savior declares. I am the door. Anyone who comes into the fold through me will be safe. Dear brothers and our friends who have joined us in this program, please take note. It is our Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom God appointed to be the Savior of man on Judgment Day, who declared or who was speaking in this verse. What did our Lord Jesus Christ teach? He said, I am the door. Anyone who comes into the fold through me will be safe. Therefore, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is teaching the way to be saved. Even though there may be preachers or other professing Christians who might have other ideas, it is imperative, it is essential that we listen and obey the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how can people be saved according to our Lord Jesus Christ? People need to enter through him as the gate or the door. And where can we find those who have entered through the gate or through the door or through our Lord Jesus Christ? He clearly declares they are inside the fold or his flock. So please take note. This is not opinion, this is not theory, but this is a biblical truth and the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. For one to enter and to receive salvation, they must be inside or enter into his flock or his fold. Yeah, though, though, that's a very good point, uh, Br Brother Bernard. You know, it, to help our dear friends understand, it, you know, again, if we're being given warnings by those in authority to escape an impending judgment, why would we not heed it? It would be to our detriment if we didn't. Much in the same way, for example, if, for example, uh, we're given a prescription for medication by our trusted doctor, for example, we know that the medication is going to help us alleviate whatever's going on within ourselves. Why will we not take it to get better, to better ourselves, to save ourselves, for example? Of course, we're going to heed those things. We're going to follow the instructions given. You have to take it twice a day. You have to take it once in the morning or once in the evening. We'll do every step, everything that is necessary for us to preserve ourselves, preserve our life. Though many people want to be saved, though many people want to escape that impending judgment, when it comes to obeying what our Lord Jesus Christ teaches and instructs as the way to salvation, they don't want to follow. And it is clear his instruction is that they need to be inside the flock to be saved. Uh, indeed. There may be those who upon hearing these instructions of our Lord, okay, they've made the choice. They don't want to follow. But dear friends, please take note that God doesn't want you to perish. That's why he's speaking through our Lord Jesus Christ in wanting us to answer his call to be saved. If we've accepted Jesus as our personal Savior, we recognize Him as our Lord. Why will we not follow what the Lord teaches us to do in order to be saved? Others may be thinking, for example, you know, I, okay, I, I want to follow. It's been made clear to me. There are steps I need to take. This is what I need to do. But I don't know what the fold or the flock is or what Jesus is referring to as the fold or the flock. So, which is that fold or flock being referred to that people should get inside of to obey our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and answer God's call? Brother Noel? 
Just to point out, uh, Brother Greg, like what was mentioned earlier, this is not our opinion. This is not speculation. This isn't a theory or a teaching we made up for ourselves. Uh, let's read what is written in the book of Acts. The chapter is 20 and the verse is 28. Take it therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers to feed the church of Christ, which he has purchased with his blood. So if there are those asking, well, what is the flock where they have to enter in? The Apostle Paul is clear. The flock is the church of Christ. And how important is the church of Christ? The church of Christ is the only church purchased by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this is the reason we are firm in our conviction that those who are inside the true church of Christ are the ones who will be saved because they're the ones that are redeemed. They're the ones forgiven of their sins. And without that redemption, there is no forgiveness. And without that forgiveness, there is no salvation. And so it's for this reason that the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ issued a call concerning the people of the world. Everyone needs to enter into the true church, redeemed by Christ, the one purchased by his blood, in order for man to be saved on the day of judgment. Dear friends, we know and hopefully can feel and understand God's love for all of humanity. This call, remember, goes out to all of humanity. In order for us to escape his impending judgment, God gives a way by which we can escape it, and his call to us would be to enter into the true church of Christ, the Iglesia de Cristo in Filipino. Being the church of Christ was redeemed by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the way by which man can escape this impending judgment, much like it was in the time of Noah. There was a designated place that people could go to to escape the great flood. It was in the Ark of Noah. In the time of Lot, there was a place in the mountains that they would go to to escape that impending judgment in the valley in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. In our time, dear friends, the Church of Christ or the Iglesia de Cristo is the way by which people can escape God's impending judgment. That is God's call to all of humanity. So it's now up to us to fully benefit. And how can we fully benefit from this opportunity and grace that God gives to us? Brother Donald, let me go to you for that one. In 2 Corinthians 6 and the verses are 1 to 2, let's read this statement of the Holy Bible. In our work together with God then, we beg you who have received God's grace not to let it be wasted. Hear what God says. When the time came for me to show you favor, I heard you. When the day arrived for me to save you, I helped you. Listen. This is the hour to receive God's favor. Today is the day to be saved. Did we hear, beloved friends, beloved viewers, who are tuned in to this episode of the program? When it comes to the call of God, it's been clarified through our study today. But when is it that we need to answer that call of God? The Bible clearly teaches today is the day for our salvation. Let us not imitate or emulate those people in the past who tragically did not respond to the call of God through the messengers or through the instruments that the Lord our God sent. And because of this, they ended up in devastation, in destruction. But let us rather respond to the call of God. And let us not base the salvation of our soul on hearsay not just to accept our Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and there's nothing else to do. No, one has to physically enter the flock. They have to physically enter the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ, as was mentioned by Brother Greg earlier, which was redeemed through the blood of Christ. A person's sins are forgiven through the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we answer the call of God, then we can be pronounced as those who have obeyed the teachings of our Father in heaven, and they have the great hope of attaining salvation come the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's important for us not to put off this call of God, not to ignore it, 
not to dismiss it, but to answer it today. Now, some may be thinking, look, anytime that verse is read, it says today. But when is the certain time the term today is referring to? Dear friends, this is the biblical explanation. Brother Bernard, can you read that for us, please? Please let me share what is recorded in Hebrews 3.15. Again, this is what the Holy Scriptures teaches. This is what the Scripture says. If you hear God's voice today, do not be stubborn as your ancestors were when they rebelled against God. What does it mean today? It means that if you hear God's voice or you hear God's call, may none of us or no one disregard this call of our Almighty God. May no one fail to receive His patience and His kindness and to heed His instruction to be saved from this impending judgment. The very fact that you are being reached by this program is not only our answered prayer, but it's also the call of the entire Church of Christ all throughout the world through the leadership of our beloved Executive Minister, Brother Eduardo Vibanalo, to intensify our efforts in propagating and sharing with all our friends, all our family, all our loved ones, what is the call of our Almighty God to salvation. So we ask, please, and we pray that all of us will take this opportunity to find what our Almighty God is calling everyone in the world to, what is the love and the care of our Lord Jesus Christ, and what is the instruction for all of us to be sure of salvation on that coming day of judgment. Because, dear friends, we, we firmly believe that God will not fail anyone who truly wants to heed His call to prepare for the nearing end of this world by being gathered in the true Church of Christ, or in Filipino, the Iglesia Cristo, established by Christ, which He purchased with His blood and commands us to enter to answer this call of God. We'd like to thank Brother Bernard Daos in San Francisco, California, Brother Noel Simon in Los Angeles, California, and Brother Donald Pinock in Toronto, Canada for giving us Bible-based answers so that, as the Apostle Peter said to the members of the church, you will be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are. 1 Peter 3.15 well, that does it for us here on the Iglesia Ni Cristo International Edition. We hope you'll join us again next time. I'm Brother Greg Worthen, and thanks for watching.